If you have your Bibles, open to John chapter 18. John chapter 18 this morning. And then we do have one pad of paper to pass out here. And it says this at the top, I will pray for BBA students. And if you're willing to help us pray, Pastor Ryan, can you give me a hand, please? Uh, if you're willing to help pray for the students this year, sign up on that sheet and we'll uh, then give you some information about those students you can pray for and requests they may have in their life. Glad to see all the guests with us here today. Sure glad you're here at First Baptist Church. And then you'll find on the back table we have our brand new newsletter. We just got hot off the printer. I think it was Thursday, Pastor Dylan. Thursday here. And so make sure you pick some of these up. We'll, of course, do a big mailing to a few local areas. But these are free. Take them out. Give them to people with some great articles. And it's a good help there. So appreciate that. And Pastor Dylan, all the work he did on that brand new newsletter. Of course, emphasizing our big friend day coming up September 30th. That's going to be a great day here um, at First Baptist Church. Of course, it's great to see Miss Chris Yolette here this morning as well. And uh, many of you are Wednesday night when she was able to get back and a special thing for her. Well, this morning in John chapter 18, I want to, for a few brief moments, talk about a choice that we all have to make. You know, the truth is we all make choices every single day of our life. All right, we make a multitude of choices, some good and some not so good. Some, uh, what could we say, terrible. Amen. Thank you, thank you. You ever gone to a restaurant and you see the brand new thing offered? I remember when I was at Taco Bell when they first had those nacho fries. Anybody remember those little nacho fries? I guess they're making a comeback. And uh, they always make the advertisement look enticing, do they not? You're like, man, this will be the best thing. But I should have known because I was at Taco Bell. And that should have been my first clue. But lo and behold, I was there with some friends. They said, you got to try these fries. These are really, really, really good. All right, I should have known that as well, not only being at Taco Bell, but because I normally don't trust my friends when they say something is very, very, very good. Well, I got some of those fries, and let me be honest, it was a bad choice in my life. I was not happy with the result of my life, as I seldom am at Taco Bell. I remember in college, I had a roommate who was from Japan. His name was Tepe Sato. First time I walked into his room, he said, hello. And I said, hello, Tepe. And, uh, and Tepe, had, his parents sent him there to, to, to college with me. We had a great time there. But one day, his parents sent him a box of snacks from Japan. And inside this box of snacks, I don't remember everything. I remember one thing. There was a bag of these little silver fish and slivers of almonds. And he is chowing them down like they're Cheetos. And I'm like, he's like, you know, these are so good. And he's, and he's just throwing these things down. I said, well, Tepe, let me try some of those. And I put them in my mouth, and it was a bad choice. <laughs> it was probably the worst thing I've ever eaten in my life. But you know, sometimes you make a bad choice, you can then make a good choice. My best friend was watching this scenario happen. His name was Dave. He ended up marrying my, my sister. He's my brother-in-law now. And Dave and I would also often pull pranks on each other. And as I put these, this, this, these little silver fish, like you find in a fish tank, and these slivers of almonds in my mouth, and I tasted this horrid, putrid mixture of just pure death in my mouth, Dave asked me, well, how is it, J.D.? <laughs> and I fought back the feeling of throwing up in my mouth. And I plastered a completely fake smile on my face and said, these are delicious, Dave. <laughs> and I made yet another even better choice. I took some more, put them in my mouth, and ate them. Not for my benefit. <laughs> and Dave says, really? I said, oh, you got to try some. <laughs> And my choice became a phenomenal choice as Dave put a big handful in his mouth and promptly ran to the trash can and threw up. That's when a bad choice becomes a good choice. The truth is we all make choices. We like sometimes to watch the Food Channel. And on the Food Channel, sometimes you'll see a dish called Beef Wellington. Just they make this beef and they wrap it in this pastry. And, uh, a couple years ago, my wife and I and some friends were in Chicago at this restaurant, and they had Beef Wellington on the menu. So my wife ordered Beef Wellington, but we didn't realize it was um, Beef Wellington, like, what? De deconstructed Beef Wellington. Uh, so a constructed Beef Wellington is beef wrapped in pastry. A deconstructed one is just pieces of beef and pieces of pastry on the plate. And my wife, to this day, if you, if you were to ask about this after the service, okay, please don't. 
all right, because she will still become angry, all right? She may react in a bad way. But the truth is we all make choices, some big and some little. We make choices sometimes that affect just today or a meal, and sometimes we make choices that affect long-term consequences. Sometimes people make a choice in marriage, and then they think they made the wrong choice, a big choice. I read this last week about these, this man who was, who was shot by his neighbors over a trash dispute and where they threw, where he had thrown the mattress in the trash pile. And I remember reading this, and I, as I get ready for this, I read that article and, and they talked about how they were arrested on, on, on manslaughter charges and I thought, man, I remember sitting there thinking, man, a simple choice. The rest of their life is, is forever marked by that choice. The truth is, often our choices mark us in life. And in John chapter 18, I see a choice made that forever marked all of us. John chapter 18, if you would start in verse number 28 with us, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. They themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went, out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered him, I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one of the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And there is a choice to now be made. There is a choice given to the multitude, to the crowd. There is a choice that is proposed from Pilate, the leader of the land. He said, listen, there's a tradition that I will release one person unto you at this feast time. Will you have me release unto you the king of the Jews? He'd already declared him to be innocent. He said, I find no fault in him. In verse number 40, our text for this morning, Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, that your spirit would work. Lord, help us to be tender. Help us to learn from Scripture, Lord. May you do something this morning in this place. Help us to respond the way we ought to. And would you accomplish all that you want to here? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. One of the saddest phrases I would find in the Bible, the phrase that the crowd has shouted out as the Bible says again, the phrase that says, not this man, but Barabbas. The scene, of course, is the time when Christ was delivered up. He was betrayed by a kiss on the cheek. He was dragged through the sham of a trial. The chief priest and other people had vehemently accused him of doing horrible things. All right, they at that time did not bring up accusations that we can find where he had healed people and where he had cast out the demons and where he had fed everyone. They did not accuse him of that. They said, no, we accuse him of setting up another government 
Because they knew if they could convict him of that, then Pilate or Herod, either one of them, would say, no, you can't do that. The Romans are in charge, so we'll, commend, we'll commit you to death. But Pilate repeatedly said, I find no fault in this man. Another passage of scripture earlier in the, in, the, in the day or a little bit before this, Pilate's wife had sent to him and said, Pilate, don't have anything to do with this man because I had a terrible dream about him last night. And Pilate ignored that as well. He comes back to Jesus and he asks him again, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered like we read. He goes, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight for me, but it's not of this world. And we as Christians know this, that the kingdom of God is eternal. Christ has saved us. That is the kingdom of God. Pilate asked that question, well, then what is the truth or what is truth? I find that ironic because often people ask that question, today what is truth? You know, where is truth? And truth is relative and, and truth is what you imagine it to be. And we believe that truth is found in Jesus Christ because he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. A better question Pilate could have asked would have been, who is truth? And Pilate wasn't seeking for truth. He was seeking to argue right there. You see, Nicodemus in John chapter 3 came at night, and he also inquired about truth and about Jesus, and Jesus spent the time to talk to him. Pilate goes back out, as we read into the crowd, and says, all right, you have to decide now. And we find another passage that the, that the rulers and the elders and the high priests had shamed and moved the crowd in Matthew chapter 27. And so the multitude in the crowd was just, was just in a just huge tumultuous uproar. And they shouted again, not this man, we want Barabbas. And you can imagine what that scene was like and just the pure chaos that was taking place at this time. You see that choice, not this man, but Barabbas. And I want you for the next few moments explain what they missed and what we can miss as well. I think, first of all, they miss the significance of Christ. You see, Christ was the Messiah, the anointed one. He was promised throughout the Old Testament, beginning in Genesis chapter 3, in the very first few chapters of the Bible, in very, the very first time of man, after man sinned, there was a promise of one who was coming, promised of Jesus, and this is the Messiah that they were looking for. He was the promised one. He was the anointed one. We find this same promise throughout the Old Testament, but in Psalms 22, 35, 69, and 118, Isaiah chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 35, chapter 50, chapter 52, chapter 53, chapter 59, and Daniel, and Malachi, and Zechariah, and throughout the Old Testament. And he was promised, but they missed it. But they missed the promise. They were looking for something else. They were looking for something that was promised, and they didn't realize it was right in front of them. We are often promised certain things that we miss. We're over-promised many things. If you ever watch TV, you'll find over-promises. Have you ever bought something from a TV infomercial? And please tell me you haven't, all right? What do they say? I was studying for this last night, and I happened to come across this thing. They're called, I believe they're called the tater gloves. All right, and these tater gloves, they promise to peel potatoes in eight seconds flat. And there are these blue gloves with these, like, I don't know, all these, these, and I hope you don't own these things. If you do, all right, then shame on you, all right, don't tell me. But they showed, in the commercial, in the infomercial, this guy is smiling. Do you hate to peel potatoes? You know how they talk the same way? And, and then the water turns on, and he, like this, and, ah, you know, and the, and the potato sparkles, right? Because potatoes always sparkle when you peel them. And, and then right after that, there was a guy who posted a video on his test of the tater gloves, and he, <laughs> he said, here's my tater gloves. And he put them on, he turned on the water, and he begins to scrub them. And he counted to ten. And at the end of ten, he held up the potato, and none of it was peeled. Not one single peeling came off the potato. He said, these are a sham. He goes, just please don't show my mother this video because she bought these for me. <laughs> Overpromised, underdelivered. But Jesus never underdelivers. He was promised, and they missed it. They missed it. Remember when the Chia Pet craze hit America? How many owned a Chia Pet? Oh, good. Oh, boy. Shame on all of you. There's a new one out. There's a President Trump Chia Pet, in case you're wondering. Why we think this is a good idea. All right? I, I love cutting grass, but not inside my house. 
I like the grass on the front yard or the backyard or side yard, but not on my kitchen table. But they missed the fact that he was promised. Oh, they knew it. They knew it. They had studied their scripture. They knew that someone was coming, the Messiah was coming, but he was promised and they missed it. They missed it and they missed that he was the one they were looking for. The wise men found it. The wise men realized it. In Matthew chapter 11, there were some that came to Jesus and said unto him, Art thou that it should come or do we look for another? You know, Christ is the one that people are looking for and they don't even know it. I'm talking about today, Christ is the one that people are looking for and they don't even know it. Christ is the one that promises life and not only a life, he promises an abundant life. He says, if you come to me, all ye that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. In America, we are looking for rest. People fight for their time off. There are so many self-help things on how to deal with stress. Take a few moments every day and take a breath. Take care of yourself. Love yourself. Do something that you enjoy doing. Don't be too stressed. Stress is the cause of anxiety, depression, and weight gain in your life. I mean, stress, 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 and self-help on stress, and ways to deal with stress. Buy yourself a steam generator, or a sauna, or a hot tub, or all, hot tub, or all three together. Because the world, everyone wants to find peace and rest in their life. I think we've all felt that way. You get home from work after a long day, and you're like, man, I am just war out or everything comes together in your mind and everything weighs on you heavy and you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders you're like i just can't deal with this man it's just so stressful and jesus offers peace he offers peace and they don't even know that jesus is the one they're looking for just like the crowd the multitude and, and, and the elders and the high priest did not even realize this is the one you're looking for he's the one right there standing across from you the one you're yelling at that's the one he offers peace jesus offers life the age-old question what happens after i die religions around the world have tried to deal with this question some deal with it with the answer well, you have to do certain things in order to have a better life when you die. In order to come back as a bigger bug or a bigger animal, then make sure you're kind to people. Make sure you do good deeds. And if you do these things, then you'll have a good afterlife. Some religions even teach that if you sacrifice yourself, then you're guaranteed a better afterlife. And there's all these solutions on this, and, and then you have this some that say, you know what, it doesn't matter what you do, what is is going to be. What has been can't be changed. Others say, listen, pray for the ones who have gone on before, because hopefully by your prayers, you can affect their afterlife. And they don't even realize that Jesus brings the solution to what happens when I die. Jesus brings a solution, and he tells us that we're all sinners, but that he, and he shows that he died for us, that by trusting in him and him alone, that we don't have to spend one day in hell, not one day in, in condemnation and judgment, but we can spend a life in heaven. You know that everyone wants to go to heaven? I have met, I take that back, I've met one person who wanted to go to hell, but I think they're joking with me. All right, people don't want a bad outcome when they die. What do, you want to, what do you want to happen when you die? Oh, I want to be tormented forever. No. No, and I've been to many funerals. I've, I've now done some funerals for the, for the local, uh, for Casey's Funeral Home of people who are not part of our church. They need a pastor to come. These people have never trusted Christ. Maybe the family hasn't. They don't know about heaven, but they want their loved one in heaven for sure. People want to be in heaven Right? They want a wonderful place, and Jesus brings that. And they didn't even realize that he was the one they were looking for. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. They miss the significance. They miss that he was the Messiah, that he was the one they were looking for. They miss this. They miss that he was God. They miss that he was God, that he was deity, that he was the son of God himself. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How would you treat a VIP guest today at lunch? Let's just take Pastor Olette, for example. He's a nice guy. And if I said, Pastor Olette is coming to your house for lunch, what would you do after church? Would you rush home very quickly and clean the house to make sure everything was picked up? 
probably most of us would, just to make sure. Wives, for sure, no matter how clean your house is, it's never clean enough. I know that. Would you say, you know what, Pastor Let, he likes to eat, I'm sure, so we'll get, some, uh, we'll get some chicken nuggets from McDonald's for him. That'll be good. Would you do that? Probably not. You at least get him a Big Mac. All right, he's a nice guy. But then what if I said, you know what, um, one of the men running for governor, Bill Schutte, is coming for lunch today. Maybe, maybe the next governor of our state of Michigan. Not the governor yet. What would you say then? Oh, he may be the next governor. Boy, I could have the maybe the next governor at, at lunch at my house. Would you run home and clean it? Probably. Would you get him a Big Mac? Well, probably a quarter pounder with cheese. What if I said, you know what? I just got a phone call, and President Trump wants to eat lunch with you today. You say, well, I don't know if I like him or not, but I bet you'd still eat lunch with him. You'd probably still run home and clean the house, and would you get him a quarter pounder with cheese, or would you get him... Taco Bell nacho fries. <laughs> of course, you'd find something good for him. Well, what if we said, the Son of God wants to eat at your house today for lunch? What would you do? You say, you know what? He can have whatever he wants for lunch. You know what? I'll make sure the house is really, really clean. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible because Jesus is coming over for lunch today. And they missed the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, was standing in front of them. They missed it. And they said, not this man. No, did they miss the significance. They missed the solution that Christ brings. You see, Christ can answer every single problem that we have. You heard that this morning in the testimonies. You heard problem after problem after problem. And you heard the men say, but Jesus and Jesus, and Jesus, and Jesus. Did you hear that? They realized that Jesus brought every solution. You know, in the, this age we live in, we can Google anything. You can find answers to most of life problems on the internet. How do you change this brake pad? You Google it and someone has done it. What is this particular spot on my hand? You Google it. Now, don't do that because you'll find that you have some rare form of leprosy that has never been found before, and you have it right here at First Baptist Church. And and people have diseases they never thought they ever had. But I don't have to Google the answer for Christ's problems. The Bible tells me. He says, when you're afraid, I can trust in thee. He says, when you're lonely, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. When you don't have enough money, he says, my God shall supply all your needs. When you're worried about tomorrow, he says, take no thought for tomorrow. When you feel like living for God is too hard, he says, take my yoke upon you. And when you need victory in your life, Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John chapter 8, verse 32. You know, Jesus brings the answer to every one of life's problems. And we have an awful lot of them. It's easy to become isolated in our mind and to think that we're the only one who faced this particular problem. Sometimes it's with a child. Sometimes it's with a spouse. Sometimes it's with a sickness. Sometimes it's with a job situation. And I don't know what your problem may be today, but I know this, that Jesus can answer every one of your problems. Every single one of them. You say, well, how? He says, come unto me. He says, ask and you shall receive. He says, if you come unto me, you'll have fine joy and your joy will be full. He answers every earthly problem and he answers your eternal one as well. What I find in this passage, it just breaks my heart. It's when that crowd says, not this man, but Barabbas. And that last little phrase I read, now Barabbas was a what? A robber. Barabbas was a thief. Barabbas had stole from them before. That's why he was committed to die. He, he was there. He was going to be executed for what he had done. And they said, no, we don't want the one who had fed us at times. We don't want the one who had healed us at times. We don't want the one who brings answers to the problems. We want the one to steal from us again. What? Are you kidding me? In another passage, it says something like, like, we want him to do these things again. Barabbas. They knew what they were asking for. Now, I was robbed once. It's a terrible feeling. Hopefully you've never been robbed. But I never want to be robbed again. 
Or actually twice now. I think it twice, actually twice. Right? Okay, twice. Yeah, one time my car was stolen. And you know what? I like having a car. I'd rather not be stolen again. It's, it's minorly inconvenienced to have your car stolen in life. Or it's a little inconvenienced to have your house broken into. And if someone had stolen from me and was in jail, and they said, hey, would you rather have Jesus come over or this thief? Who do you think I'd vote for? Who would you vote for? Oh, you know, I was, I was kind of liking my stuff too much. I hope he gets some more of it. Like the thief. But that's what they asked for. They asked for a thief. Can I submit this? There are people all over this world, people in this church, who instead of choosing Jesus, choose a thief. Anytime you choose yourself over Jesus, you're robbing yourself. Things are stolen from you. Your joy is stolen. Your happiness is stolen. Your peace is stolen. Your contentment is stolen. Your life not be yours. And there are people all over the world trading Jesus for a thief. They're saying, yeah, I don't want him. I want that. Wouldn't it be a shame to come to First Baptist Church on a Sunday morning hear about Jesus, but instead of choosing Jesus, you choose a thief. In just a few moments, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask an important question. I'm going to ask if you're sure that you're on your way to heaven. And I hope at that moment that you've thought and considered that particular truth. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. You'll have a choice like everyone uh, has made, whether to accept Christ or to reject him. Whether to say yes to Christ or to say no, not this, not this man. Many people in here have accepted Christ as their Savior. They've realized that they're a sinner, but that Jesus died for them. And that by be believing in Jesus and him alone, they'll spend eternity with him forever. And I bet that in some hearts this morning, the Holy Spirit's working. He's saying, that's you. You've never trusted Christ today. A few moments, I'll pray. And then we'll have what we call an invitation time. And we'd love to open the Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Would you choose Jesus today? Lord, I thank you for your word.